Oops, what happened? And, uh, and then you can start looking at temporal patterns. And what I want to bring your attention here, I did it. Yeah, okay, I'm good. Yeah, sorry, man, don't get upset with me, Bill. Um, so um, what I found interesting here is that the how, how, how uh, uh, weather patterns may influence the fluxes of CO2 are not necessarily how the temporal variability of other fluxes like methane or nitrous oxide will respond. So we see that for CO2, there's DL patterns, synoptic patterns, and maybe seasonal patterns, but we don't see that for other fluxes. So when do we measure this? If we can measure once a week, is that okay? Do we measure once a month? Do we measure in the morning? Do we measure in the evening? When it rains, it seems a little bit complicated for, uh, for methane fluxes. And then when you combine these with automated measurements, then it becomes even more complicated. And we have example now of three trees here uh, at, uh, throughout a year, and uh, temporal patterns are not even similar between trees, among trees. So are we doing, this is the problem of manual measurements versus automated measurements. And, and, and here I see it even larger, the problem on modeling and upscaling these fluxes. So there are many open questions. I've mentioned a few, spatial variability, temporal variability, the magnitudes, and drivers. So what is, what, how, what is, uh, what is happening? And um, this is a big effort that uh, Joseph Barba is leading, which is called it methane, methane traits. And he decided that it's important to study the wood properties to explain the fluxes. Uh, and with the idea that there is methane production, um, there is going to be some internal methane concentrations, and there's going to be some gas diffusivity that if you know these things, you might be able to understand at least uh, the, uh, the diffusion part and maybe explain some of the fluxes. So he focused on wood properties, and here's a series of characteristics that, uh, that, that, uh, that the, the, this, this project is going to look at. Um, and the idea is to do crowd, crowd uh, science. So he asked for help for many people, maybe several of you have participated in this. And right now he has about 23 locations, 66 species around the world. Uh, the data is being um, uh, uh, processed and collected. It's maybe take a little bit of time, but this is how the, the, the community is participating on this, uh, on this global effort. And with that, I just want to say a few, uh, a few remarks of where to go. Uh, I'm just kind of repeating uh, some of the things that I measured, but baseline emissions are important to know. We don't know how, what is this, this fluxes if, uh, and how they vary across ecosystems. Uh, of course, we need to do this long-term monitoring. These are just very short-term exercises at these moments. What are the trade-offs between uh, CO2 and methane? And also, what is the trade-off between the methane capture from soils or emissions? How much that will add? This will, imp it will be relevant for this community because if you have any covariance uh, measurements, then how is the, what is the contribution of the different sources uh, from soils and from tree stems? Of course, what are the environmental controls? What are the species are contributing on this? We talk a lot about the spatial and temporal variability. And then one of the things that I didn't talk about was microbial communities. So who is living there? Because if methane is produced inside the tree, who is producing that methane? Um, and then if you can put this together, how are we going to model this? What are the climate implications? And then if this is a big thing, or can we do any ecosystem management practices to understand how forest practices may uh, influence emissions from methane from these surfaces? And with that, I just want to say thank you to uh, Dan Warner and uh, Joseph Barba, which were the, the leaders for this uh, most of the work that I presented today. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. How can you tell the messing flux is uh, from from the xenon mix from xenon versus uh, from some messengers and might just uh, living right under the bark? So there have been some incubation experiments where people will, will take the core and it can be those incubations. So they have been, uh, there's evidence that you can have production of methane. So that's the one thing. And I believe, I mean, John has more evidence on that and actually trying to extract the microbial communities and, and relate the production rates 
with who is there. And that's what I think the science is going to. Thanks. I appreciate the shout out to the Tumble podcast, which is the reason why my daughter tells everybody I study ecosystem farts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thanks for that. Uh, I had a question. I was wondering if um, there could be uh, a, re a potential reason why it's not related to sap flow, if the production of methane deep within the groundwater that the trees are picking up might vary through time. So I was just curious, like having measured this um, through time in a couple places, did you notice any um, variability or did you measure um, the production of methane beneath the soil? So we only did it in one site. And in this site, we actually went and tried to measure methane production, like just to see deep in the soil. We went down to a, a meter and a half and we didn't see methane in this specific, no? So if forests are well-drained, then you should not have methane in theory. But if the one ground water table is off, then 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 there could be for, for this specific site, the conclusion was that methane is likely produced within the tree because we went down and we didn't see it. But if you go down and you see there's methane down there, you know, maybe that could be that there you have a methanotrophy, but then deeper you might have some methanogenesis. And then yes, but we have to go deeper into the soil. And that's a very good point. Thanks for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, have you seen any relationship with tree uh, tree age, like with the age of the tree? <laughs> That's a question for John. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, every every so I've done sort of similar work looking at over 150 trees and working with Jackie to do some long term monitoring on some trees at Harvard Forest, um, and. Everything that we think is going to be a clear predictor winds up not being. <laughs> um, so uh, in upland trees, we've seen, pos I'm not convinced this is real, but if anything, negative correlation between tree flux and GBH. Um, but a lot of that, I think, is confounded by landscape position, where you have smaller trees often in the wetter areas, even in the upland system. Um, and yeah, we're seeing meth definite methanogen presence in the wood of these trees that we've cored but the abundance of methanogens doesn't seem especially related to the flux out of the tree either. So I, I, I think it's all of these different, like small rates of production at depth, transport processes, diffusion processes, internal production rates, um, and uh, internal consumption rates and bark oxidation that get really, really hard to parse out. Um, there, I think that older trees, if they're likelier to have rot, are likelier to have more production, but it's so variable individual to individual that we haven't really picked up on that yet. Yeah. And methane, methane traits is going to help answering that question. Well, thank you, Hitler. We had one more question right here. If they are transported by the, yeah. Yeah, that, the, that's a great the, question. So sorry. there are there are some groups mainly in Finland that have been doing that. So they have seen that there are some uh, emissions. Uh, what the, the mechanism? No, like right now it's not. I, I heard a talk a few a few months ago. It's not not super clear, and there are some challenges. But uh, but uh, but but there are uh, uh, groups doing that, and of course you can do it here in the Harvard Forest because you have access to those type of towers. So yeah, that's 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 important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, hey, our uh, next speaker is uh, online, uh, Teresa Yesbik. Um, yeah, just a second, try to share the screen. Uh, so you're seeing my screen or the, I have to switch them, swap them. We need you to uh, switch out a presenter view if you can. Yeah, I think it's an yeah it worked out. So yeah, I'm I'm speaking through a different device than the one I'm sharing. So please let me know if uh, if I'm 
you can't hear me. Um, okay, uh, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for attending this session. So I'm Teresa Yazbek, and I'll be presenting today uh, about our work in trying to reduce uh, the uncertainty of methane emissions from wetland using Earth uh, system models uh, by coupling it with the classification of eco-hydrological batch types within the wetland using high resolution remote sensing uh, product. Um, so, so where many of us are familiar with uh, methane emissions from wetland, methane is a very potent greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas and wetlands are the highest biogenic uh, emitter of methane uh, globally. But uh, as you can see in this, uh, this global study uh, that methane emissions from wetlands uh, are very uncertain. So there's a high uncertainty that lies in trying to estimate the emissions and the sink and sources of methane uh, within the wetland. And this is largely due to the within wetland heterogeneity that is responsible of methane dynamics. So within a wetland, there are multiple hydro, uh, eco-hydrological patches, which is different vegetation. We have open water, we have mud fat, and the different the processes uh, responsible uh, about responsible of uh, for methane dynamics uh, dif differ by orders of magnitude between these different uh, different eco-hydrological patches, especially that it's. It requires an interaction of eco -hydrologic, uh, ecological, hydrological, microbial, and biogeochemical uh, and, uh, processes. So in order to better estimate the emissions of methane from wetlands, we need to represent these different uh, eco-hydrological patches in Earth system model so we can represent this heterogeneity and try to reduce the, the uncertainty of, of methane emissions. Uh, we are working on the DOE Earth System model known as E3SM. Uh, we're focusing on the land model where this is uh, what the typical uh, grid cell would, would look like. So wetland are one of the land units that form a grid cell. So what we try to do is to, to have, to represent the different patches uh, or vegetation within a wetland through that land unit. Uh, one main difference we, 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 we made it compared to the typical soil, uh, soil column that form a vegetation land unit, is that we decided to have each co soil column to represent a different vegetation or patch type uh, compared to a vegetation land uh, soil column where each soil column would have different vegetation within it. And we decided to, that, to do that so we can prescribe different hydrological constraints or properties that are different for each plant functional type since the hydrology is resolved at the column level. Uh, one of the main difference we've done is that we've limited the water leakage at the bottom two soil layer of the, of the column. And then we've set uh, surface water elevation constraint by either setting a maximum inundation depth or by forcing the surface water depth by, uh, by a time series that we could, we could input it into, into the model. So for example, we could represent deep water, like submergent uh, vegetation that grow usually in deep water and emergent vegetation, uh, sorry, emergent vegetation that grow in deep water and then submerged vegetation in shallower uh, water or shrubs and meadow that grows by the shoreline. So one main change also we've tackled in the model is we, we try to to update the Irankama transport model. So ELM uh, resolved the five main processes responsible of methane, methane production, oxidation, ebullition, diffusion, and Irankama transport. So we tried to use field measurement uh, and use uh, field informed uh, resistance or conductance to methane flux through the vegetation and to include it into, into our model. So we've used Using the gas scouter, we've measured uh, the methane flux from the leaf, so which which we get as the per leaf area methane flux. And for the same vegetation type, we we have peepers that measures uh, soil concentration for methane. So by having flux and concentration, we could derive a per leaf area uh, resistance or conductance to the methane uh, flux for each vegetation type. So having that from the field, and then we use the current scheme for the soil uh, soil layer uh, in, in ELM 
and the current vegetation uh, structure and parameters that are already in the model. And we used mainly two assumptions. Uh, first, that the resistance to methane flux, uh, to Iranchema methane flux, is proportional to the root length at each soil layer. And the per leaf area flux from each soil layer is proportional to the concentration gradient and the root fraction at each soil layer. So having uh, the field scheme and the Iranchema model, we could set them equal to together and derive uh, and derive our wetland vegetation parameter that is direct directly being informed from uh, from from measurements from the field, mostly uh, chamber measurements and soil concentration profile. So we've used the so we uh, we applied these uh, changes to the model to uh, to one of our the site uh, of our site in Louisiana. It's uh, a Mariflux site. USLA2 freshwater, it's a freshwater uh, march. It's like 30 minutes away from New Orleans. It's mostly uh, covered by Sagittaria and Cefolia with some intrusion of Typha. So we represented these two, uh, these two vegetation in, uh, in our model. In terms of field measurement, we had many, we had uh, chamber measurements, peepers, and eddy covariance tower for carbon and uh, and methane flux. The tower was set up in 2012, 2013, and then later again in 2021. So we used this uh, to set up data. Mainly we parameterized uh, using eddy covariance data over the year 2012, 2013, and then which is our training data set, and then we validated it with 2021 uh, data set. We used the BOA. BOA is a Bayesian optimization wrapper. It was recently developed, and it's, uh, it's a, basically it's a Python wrapper uh, using some Python libraries where we developed uh, a wrapper specific for ELM that could uh, that could parameterize for any parameter uh, for the model using any time series you'd have uh, in, in order to and using Bayesian optimization. So we used GPP from eddy covariance uh, ecosystem respiration and methane flux. And we parameterized or optimized uh, several, uh, up to eight parameters. They mostly represent the photosynthesis rate, respiration rate, and methane production and, uh, and oxidation. Uh, here, we'd like to show um, the first set of our results. So we're showing the time series observed versus modeled, uh, modeled methane flux. And in the bottom, uh, we're showing the regression of, uh, at the far left is, is, the reg is, is we're showing the regression of modeled versus observed of a default ELM, the one like we did not let, like touch. And then we moved, we, we're comparing it to ELM where we added the wetland land unit and used the wetland land unit scheme, but using one soil column, basically one uh, patch type, but using the old Arankema model. And then we moved to the new Arankema model with one patch type. And then the, the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, plot is the fully developed ELM. And as you can see, all the metrics are, are improving by going left to right, better R square better slope and uh, lower uh, root mean square error, which, uh, which, which is helping in reducing basically the uncertainty and estimating uh, methane flux. Here we're showing um, for the dominant plant uh, function type and the side, the soil concentration profile con uh, observed versus, uh, versus modeled where for most of the time and the measurements we had, we had modeled like within the range of, of, of observed. Uh, so lastly, I would like to discuss uh, our uh, the coupling we're, we're working on, on for using HLS, Harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2 data for classifying the wetland, uh, the wetland vegetation, and then use that classification, that yearly classification to inform ELM with a different, uh, with, the, with the percentage of the vegetation cover so we can uh, analyze the resulting methane flux that's coming uh, that's that would come out of the wetland and we could we could uh, we could see the effect of changing the vegetation uh, structure not st the vegetation distribution the effect of vegetation distribution on the resulting methane flux so in brief the the classification using hls was published last year um, so we're we're basically using the time series of NDVI uh, derived from from the HLS product, where we have the pixels that within that lies 
the pig says that has one just one type of vegetation type so those are the thick lines so we have this different echohydrological type each would have its own a clean uh time series and then we use a dynamic time warper that would uh for the mixed for the pixels that are mixed uh that are a mix of different vegetation so using the dynamic time warper it could assign for each of these pixel its dominant plant functional type so this is how would the product could be and then we could using this method for each year we could have the classification of the wetland vegetation and then for example this is the study was done for old women creek it's a wetland by the coast of lake erie and lake erie uh, water depth is increasing really at a fast rate so we had that impact impacting the vegetation distribution in the wetland uh, so for example cattail which grows in in shallower uh, shallower yeah and like shallow water disappeared over like the la disappeared lately so so we eventually uh, would like to see to evaluate the resulting methane flux by incorporating this hls classification and in, in, in elm um at the end i would like to thank all the all who made this work possible and i'm happy to take any question We have time for big questions. Thank you, Teresa. That was great. Neat work. I couldn't hear if you said if there's plans or how it will be to incorporate this methane model into methane model. the global into the global version of ELM for general use. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I could uh, the question, yeah, but I uh, guess the question is how we could incorporate uh, the HLS work into ELM uh, model. If I'm wrong, please correct me. So, so yeah, so basically from ELM, we could get the, the, yearly, uh, the yearly vegetation cover of the wetland. So that could be used as as a forcing for the for for the vegetation distribution of uh, within the wetland. So, for example, uh, in the um, yes. So so basically, I we need to know what's the percentage of each of these columns that form the grid set, and that percentage or vegetation cover cover will come from HLS. So we need to incorporate that to have it dynamically. To have whenever we provide the the time series of HLS, the model will generate uh, basically the the resulting vegetation cover and will force it into the model for having the different percentages of the different vegetation types. So so ELM can basically calculate the resulting effect of changing vegetation cover on the methane flux. Thank you, nurse. Thank you, nurse. Okay, we'll uh, move to our uh, final speaker for this session. Uh, Sarah Knox is also joining us virtually. Hi, everyone. Uh, apologies, I couldn't be there in person. I'd hoped to join in person, but we have sick kiddo and husband at home. So I'm joining you all remotely. Um, all right. Great. Uh, well, uh, really nice talks this morning, continuing on the methane vein. Here I'll be talking um, about methane fluxes from wetlands in the prairie pothole region, focused in Canada, uh, and really looking at the importance of salinity or sulfate in uh, regulating greenhouse gas fluxes across the region. So just a little bit of background here. Um, nothing too new for, for folks. Um, who've been studying methane, but we know that wetlands play an important role in the climate system. They provide the ideal environment for carbon sequestration and long-term storage of atmospheric CO2, so they can have high rates of um, photosynthesis, but low rates of respiration. Uh, and despite covering 
uh, only about you know up to nine percent of the Earth's land surface. They can hold as much as thirty percent of global soil carbon, and so they're amongst the most carbon-rich sinks on the planet. <clears throat> um, while peatlands are responsible for the majority of carbon stored in wetlands, uh, freshwater <clears throat> uh, freshwater mineral uh, soil wetlands can play uh, uh, an important. They they can also be important carbon stores. Um, and they tend to be much more productive uh, relative to peat forming wetlands. So even though they're smaller in area, um, they can store a lot of carbon. And so the no North American prairie pothole region, so this region highlighted in green, covers an area of about 800,000 uh, square kilometers. And this area is dotted with millions of freshwater mineral soil wetlands. And these are you know, typically referred to as prairie pothole wetlands. Um, Compared to other types of wetlands, such as, you know, bogs or more northern peatlands, much fewer studies have focused on the prairie pothole region, uh, despite their high carbon sequestration capacity. Um, so, you know, the conditions that allow these wetlands to store a lot of carbon, uh, you know, productive uh, low decomposition rates uh, are also conditions that uh, result in high methane fluxes. And so these prairie pothole wetlands um, have been observed to be among some of the highest reported methane fluxes uh, amongst all freshwater wetlands. Um, methane fluxes across the prairie pothole wetlands uh, have been observed to vary quite dramatically, um, you know, orders of magnitude across this region. Um, and this is in part uh, driven by a wide range of uh, sulfate dominated salinities. Um, and so the prairie pothole region, um, you know, sort of due to its undulating topography and groundwater interactions with sulfur and carbonate rock uh, glacial till, it has a wide range of um, salinities across this region. And so previous work has shown that higher sulfate concentrations, not surprisingly, tend to be linked to lower methane emissions. Um, and so there's been, as I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, uh, some studies or quite a few studies have, that have been conducted throughout the prairie pothole regions, um, but typically done using chamber-based measurements. Uh, to date, there've been no uh, eddy covariance measurements within these ecosystem types. Uh, and so in 2021, in partnership with our colleagues from Ducks Unlimited Canada, um, and some collaborators at the University of Lethbridge, we set up two eddy covariance towers in uh, freshwater mineral wetlands of the prairie pothole regions here in Manitoba, so in southern Manitoba. And we have two um, different wetland types, or two different wetlands, and I'll describe them shortly, but we were interested in looking at what is the annual greenhouse gas budget of these two wetland sites. Uh, and then looking at what are the biophysical drivers of CO2 and methane fluxes across these two sites and do they differ between these two wetland sites. Uh, so as I mentioned, there are some differences in between these two sites. Uh, the hog wetland here is a much more homogeneous site. So it's dominated by emergent vegetation. So uh, tules or Schoeneplectus species. Um, this wetland is uh, a marsh, isolated, uh, an isolated marsh within a grassland, and it tends to be characterized by high sulfate concentrations. The young wetland is a much more heterogeneous site, so consisting of open water um, and vegetation, so mainly typha. Uh, this is uh, an isolated um, cropland marsh, so a wetland isolated within a cropland, uh, and it tends to be characterized by lower sulfate concentrations. So these two sites are relatively nearby. So if we look at meteorological conditions between the two different wetlands, um, so hog, the more homogeneous site in yellow, young, the more heterogeneous site in blue, we can see that due to their proximity, they have relatively similar environmental conditions between sites. So, you know, radiation, temperature, vapor pressure deficit. Um, we tend to see higher water levels um, here at the young site relative to the hog site. We have multiple years of measurements now. So going back from June, 2021, um, you know, all the way to present day. Uh, so we can look at differences between years. One thing we saw is that the 2022 growing season tends to be cooler um, and drier than in 2021. Um, we also see that um, there's differences in water levels between the years, so higher water table depth in 2022 due um, to a deeper snowpack, so melt of that snowpack raising the water levels. 
Um, one of the big differences that we see between the sites, so we have differences in vegetation, obviously, but we also see large differences in water quality. So this is looking at a principal component analysis um, of the different, um, different variables that they measure across the two sites. Um, and what we can clearly see is that they tend to cluster. So hog here, our more uh, homogeneous site, tends to be dominated by higher sulfates, um, conductivity, um, dissolved organic carbon, different nitrogen species, um, and here uh, higher uh, or more recalcitrant, this ABS-280, uh, more recalcitrant um, dissolved organic carbon. Whereas if we look at the young site here, we can see that it tends to have um, higher phosphorus, so total phosphorus or total dissolved phosphorus and higher pH. Um, so even though they're close by, they're you know experiencing relatively similar uh, environmental conditions, they have very large differences in water quality uh, parameters. Um, not too surprisingly, this leads to differences in greenhouse gas fluxes. Um, so here we can see greater uh, growing season uptake at our hog wetland here. So more emergent vegetation, higher net CO2 uptake. Um, we also see this in the photosynthesis, so higher GPP. Um, at our hog site relative to the young site. Um, but we see higher methane emissions at young. So this, you know, uh, more open water site, uh, we tend to see much higher methane fluxes relative to hog, which has, you know, almost no uh, methane fluxes coming out over the course of the year uh, and very little variation from one year to the next. Um, and, you know, without knowing a priori, these differences in water quality, um, you know, I asked uh, Darian, my grad student who was working on this, you know, <laughs> is there something wrong with the sensor? Why don't we see any methane? Uh, so if we look at annual budget, so here we have our uh, net CO2 flux um, or a net ecosystem exchange at our hog and our young site. We can see the hog site tends to be a net CO2 sink uh, with some interannual variability, um, but relatively low methane fluxes. Um, so quite low, particularly for what we would classify as a freshwater mineral wetland. Um, and so we could see that um, it tends to be, if we look at the net greenhouse gas budget, and it tends to be a net greenhouse gas sink. Whereas the young wetland, uh, which is you know, more spatially variable, uh, if we look at sort of the integrated um, budget over the year, it tends to be you know, relatively carbon neutral or a slight source, but it has higher methane fluxes, uh, making this a net greenhouse gas source. So we were interested in looking at what are the drivers um, or, you know, what drives the differences in methane fluxes across the site. So we ran um, a random forest model using data from both sites um, and input, you know, meteorological variables and water quality variables and looked at the variable important metrics. So we can see that across the site, it tends to be um, conductivity, uh, you know, which is represented of uh, the sulfate concentrations. Uh, and sort of the recalcitrance of that um, dissolved organic carbon that drove the differences in methane fluxes between the two different sites. So really this water, these differences in water quality driving differences in methane fluxes across the sites, um, which you know, I guess isn't, isn't too surprising based on what we know between the relationship of uh, sulfate and methane fluxes. But within a site, so this is looking just at young, um, we can see that it's you know much much more driven by environmental conditions. So air temperature um, or potentially productivity, sort of driving these differences uh, in methane fluxes within a site. Um, and so temperature here coming out on top, um, and you know really being a key driver of methane flux. So yeah, across sites it's driven by differences in water quality. Within sites tend to be more driven by differences in temperature. Um, but you know, these differences in water quality across sites is really important when we're trying to think about upscaling these fluxes to, to broader regions. So this is work that was done um, by my colleagues at the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, where they did some synoptic sampling across the Prairie Pothole region um, and found that this, you know, methane flux and salinity uh, relationship held uh, across the Prairie Potholes more broadly. Um, and so if we you know, if we don't consider the salinity impact, we can really overestimate um, regional uh, greenhouse gas budgets. So, um, you know, if, if we consider all of these to be freshwater mineral wetlands, 
Uh, we might overestimate their methane emissions by over fivefold. Um, but if we, you know, take into account the salinity relationship, um, it really helps, you know, shrink uh, and better constrain these these budgets across larger scales. So I think this is something important when we're thinking about coming up with, you know, national greenhouse gas inventories to really, you know, take into account this water chemistry effect. So just to summarize here, I know I'm, I'm running a little bit over time, we can see that the prairie pothole wetlands can be large CO2 sinks, particularly the more heterogeneous sites. Uh, water quality has a large impact on methane fluxes and greenhouse gas budgets. Um, and so it's important to really, you know, accurately consider these uh, water quality differences when we're trying to come up with regional greenhouse gas estimates. Uh, we've also done, this is just a little plug uh, for my former master's student, Darian Ng, uh, who is looking at uh, relating within flux footprint variability in methane fluxes to remote sensing indices. So if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, I encourage you to go to his poster this afternoon. Uh, and with that, I would like to uh, say thanks and I'd be happy to take any questions if there's time. Uh, uh, time for a few questions. Yeah, great talk. Um, I had a question about the upscaling piece. So you're saying conductivity would be an important proxy for upscaling, but how are like conductivity maps across the pothole re region? And maybe have you thought of how you might address that, the lack of that kind of data and maybe using like spectral properties of different plant communities, because maybe the conductivity is affecting the plant community, which might be something you pull out, out spectrally. Yeah, those those are great comments. You know, at the at the moment we've yeah, just relied on, you know, sort of this spatial sampling to sort of estimate this at broader scales. There isn't sort of, yeah, like you said, wide, wide scale maps of this. Um, but I do, yeah, I do have a postdoc who's looking into this a little bit more and trying to relate remote sensing indices to see if we can sort of pick up some of these water quality signals um, using remote sensing. So that's something that we're gonna be looking into. Any hey, other questions? Uh, hi, Sarah. Uh, so do you have some general suggestions uh, for wetland restoration when we consider the salinity, like for natural climate solutions? Yeah, I think that's, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting point. Um, you know, a lot, I think Dennis asked, what is the source of the salinity? A lot of it tends to be driven by the groundwater chemistry. Um, and, you know, sort of the underlying geology. So, so some of the things, you know, are sort of naturally occurring. Um, some of the salinity differences are driven by differences in agricultural input. Um, you know, I think the source of the salinity is an important factor to consider. Um, and then, you know, of course, you know, you, you don't want to sort of impact the vegetation and other aspects of ecosystem, ecosystem functioning as well. But I think, yeah, taking this into account and considering the salinity effect when when restoring these wetlands is important. I don't know how much you know we can manipulate it, but maybe target areas that have more naturally occurring, you know, um, higher sulfate concentrations could be something to think about. So where we do the restoration could be uh, could be something to consider. Final question. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank all our presenters for the great presentation. Uh, we are going to a break now. We'll be back at uh, 1020 for the online. We have a breakout uh, room for you. So please uh, join chat uh, and we'll be back here at 1020. <laughs>